Lock Haven University and the Young Americans for Liberty chapter that resides on its campus have been building a fantastic reputation over the past few years for bringing a special level of civil discourse to the students and the community. Our goal is to expand the mind of our areas to new ideas and ideological stances. Though we may disagree on numerous points of policies, it is important to remember that intellectualism has no credibility if it is not challenged. Growing our knowledge requires this challenge in the same way sharpening a knife requires a whetstone. In its absence, it becomes dull and ineffectual. Through this process of challenge, we, are, we realize that we are all individuals, all born of sovereign minds and hearts. And in our differences, we find a consistent search for truth. It is in this pursuit that we welcome Mr. David Horwitz to our campus. Mr. Horwitz is a graduate from the Columbia University and the University of California and is one of the most important political scholars in modern times. As a man who spent his early life on the far left side of politics before making the ideological journey to the right, Mr. Horwitz has a unique story and a unique acumen. He founded the David Horwitz Freedom Center, has written countless books, created the Academic Bill of Rights, and founded Students for Ameri Academic Freedom. Mr. Horwitz's accomplishments are self-evident and he has shown himself to be one of the most insightful figures in modern American politics. We are very grateful that he is gifting us with his perspicacity here tonight. And we are grateful for the opportunity to expand the breadth of our intellectual integrity. At this time, we'd like you all to join me in welcoming Mr. David Horwitz. Anyway, oh, there we go. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. As usual, I've been attacked before I opened my mouth, uh, both by your local paper, which calls me controversial. I'm only controversial to communists. And by a bunch of illiterate liars in here who have distributed this hate sheet uh, against me. Actually, I'm not really dangerous until I open my mouth. Um, my condolences for two things. One, you have a university here, which has 200 professors, but only one or two, or maybe three, conservatives. That doesn't happen by accident, and it robs you of the opportunity to have a decent education. You have to hear both sides of any controversial issue, and every issue that you are presented with as undergraduates in a liberal arts college is controversial. So even if you have well-meaning and fair-minded leftists teaching you, you're still being indoctrinated instead of getting the education that you should. When I was in school, I was a radical. My parents were communists. Um, it's many, many years ago like before your parents were born. <laughs> I always wanted to hear what the other side had to say because I thought that would make me a better radical. And now leftists want to close down the debate, silence the opposition, and the result has been a, an intellectual degeneration of the left. It's hardly worth responding the leftist arguments to these, these days because they only talk to each other and then they defame other people. And uh, interestingly, nobody signed this sheet because if they did, I would sue them for libel. 
Oh, I could create a, a palatial house for my dogs with the money. My other condolence is that this country is now, you, is now really changed from what it's been uh, and is in the midst of a civil war. The last time there was resistance, a resistance to a duly elected president was when Abraham Lincoln was elected in 1860. There isn't going to be a civil war. I mean, there will be dead people. There are dead people. I mean, it's really tragic what's happened to this country. Um, because the federal government is too powerful now. But the civil war is a political civil war that will um, be over who controls the executive power in the federal government. America had a tradition, or had a tradition, our political foundations are about compromise because people are so different. We have in this country people who come from parts of the world where they're at these, each other's throats. But in America, they live peacefully side by side. And the reason is that we have an electoral process in which you get to support your candidate. And if the wrong person wins, if the other side wins, you get to organize over two years if it's the Congress or four years if, uh, if it's the presidency to elect your person. So we've had a tradition in this country, uh, what's called the presidential honeymoon. According to the Gallup uh, organization, the presidential honeymoon normally lasts seven months. And what it does is it, it celebrates the peaceful transition of power. Everybody in this room has had a moment where they wanted to snuff out somebody who disagreed with them. Oh, it just, it's a normal human feeling, unfortunately. We don't act on it. Why don't we act on it nationally? Because we have respect for the electoral process. And we understand that if the other side wins, we get the next years to organize to beat them. Seven months. Seven months. And I, if you remember, during the campaign, when Trump said, they asked him if he would thought the election was legitimate. And he said, I'll tell you when it's over. Hillary got all bent out of shape, as you know, well she might have, because it was a threat to this idea of the peaceful transition of power and the presidential honeymoon. Seven months was the average, and that was actually shorter than it used to be. Donald Trump didn't get seven seconds. They were talking about impeaching him what a monster he was. He was a Mussolini, he was a Hitler, he was a right racist, he was a white nationalist, and, blah, blah, and on and on. He didn't get confirmation hearings for his cabinet, and this is still going on. Um, uh, Mike Pompeo was the head of the CIA. He was uh, uh, endorsed by the Senate, and the Democrats are obstructing his appointment as we speak. Um, Jeff Sessions, who desegregated the schools in, in Alabama, which is a deep south, south state, who prosecuted the Ku Klux Klan as attorney general, was attacked and defamed and lied about and called a racist. Just the way I guess I have been this evening, even though I marched in my first civil rights march in 1948, which is before the parents, your parents were even born. Um, why are we in this situation? Well, the Civil War itself was fought over slavery. As Lincoln said, you can't have a nation half slave and half free. We have a similar conflict today, and it's over what's called identity politics. Which is, what, which is really a form of cultural Marxism, which I'm going to talk about today. You can't have a, a philosophy which stigmatizes people on the basis of their skin color, their ethnic identity, their point of origin, and have a free country the way we have had. 
America was created by diverse people who were fleeing persecution. They were basically religious minorities, but they came from different countries. And so when they came to form the Union, which is, I mean, our birth certificate is really 1776, the Declaration, but the Constitution in 1787 is the formation of the Union. They created a remarkable new political formation where the goal was you're not judged by the color of your skin, but by the content of your character. We know it took 200 years to get to where we are today. Um, but that's because human nature doesn't change, so it doesn't even make adjustments that easily. The Declaration says, this, it's an astounding document. Um, let me just say, slavery existed in all countries for 3,000 years, and nobody ever said it was immoral until Wilberforce, a white Christian male in England, did. And Thomas Jefferson wrote it into the Declaration of Independence. The idea was that we're all creatures of one creator. And since we're equal in the eyes of that creator, we must be equal in the eyes of government. And that all people have the right to liberty. That was an astounding declaration. And it led to the abolition of slavery in this country and throughout the Western Hemisphere. The attacks on America begin with saying it's built on slavery and racism and we are a white supremacist culture, which is ludicrous, particularly in this day and age. We had a president in Barack Obama who was black and who was elected by 56% of his the vote, people who voted for him were white. Now, if you don't think that that is in itself a remarkable fact, there isn't a black country in the world that's elected a white president. There isn't an Asian country in the world that's elected a white person. Truly remarkable. The fact of the matter is, and people, there's a kind of racism in looking at America's origins where you confuse, you, you hear this, how many people know the phrase 400 years of slavery? Well, 1865, that would mean that American slavery started in 1465. It's ridiculous. Um, the fact of the matter is it was 87 years from the signing of the Constitution to the end of slavery. Europeans, slavery existed in Africa for a thousand years before a white person ever set foot there. White people, uh, Europeans, the English, didn't go over to Africa and throw nets over black people. They bought slaves at slave markets that were organized by black African kings and slavers. So the truth is that black people were enslaved by other black people and white Americans, beginning with a slave owner, Thomas Jefferson, and 350,000, there were, there were black soldiers in the Union armies, but mainly white people, white Americans, died to free the slaves, including the president, Abraham Lincoln. That's the reality. Anybody who uses the phrase white supremacy to describe America either belongs in a mental institution or is just consumed by hatred and is not looking at the reality. Identity politics is an attack on the fundamental American idea, which is the idea Martin Luther King was a really a conservative figure when he said that he wanted a country in which you were judged by the content of your character, not your 
color of your skin, not your gender, not your sexual orientation. That is the American ideal. Um, identity politics wants to reverse this. The first thing it thinks about is what color you are, what gender you are, what, what sexual orientation. Is. That's why we're in this civil war mode. It's an attack on this very basic American idea. Identity, people who have this vision have a phrase, well actually this phrase has entered the language, people of color. You notice that that's not even English, is it? Unless there's somebody in this room who says, here's a box of crayons of color, or I've got a television of color. It's French, it's the way the French talk. Peuple de couleur. It's an ideological term invented by leftists who are racists. And it's designed to do one thing. The whole world is people of color except guess who? White people. So white people are bad before the fact, guilty before the fact. Is there a group, people of color, that has a common interest? And this is all cultural Marxism, so it views society as oppressors and oppressed. If there's an inequality, it must be because somebody is holding a person down. If you think that the people of color have a common interest, you have to tell that to the Rwandans. Because in Rwanda, the Hutus, who are people of color, massacred a million Tutsis, who are also people of color. Or you can tell that to the Indians and the Pakistanis, who have the same ethnic uh, roots. What divides them, actually, is Hinduism versus Islam who are at war with each other. When, when India became a pen, independent, there was a communal warfare that killed them over a million people. Maharajas in India are people of color, hardly oppressed. The beheaders in Raqqa, ISIS, those are people of color. As I say, everyone in the world is people of color except the bad people, the white people. This is a vicious doctrine, identity politics, and it is aimed at white people. And the Democratic Party is totally infected with this ideology. The problem with these ideas, when you look at people's color, or their ethnic origin, or their gender, is that you lose sight of the individual. The whole idea of our founding, that we are all God's creatures and equal in his eyes, is to judge us as individuals. That's, and I think that's everybody's aspiration in this room, even the people who think that they support identity politics or that they want to see the world that way. Each of us wants to be judged for who we are as individuals. Same thing goes for uh, gender. There's another ideological term regarding gender, sexism. And sexism should be infuri infuriating to anybody who's black, the term. Because what it is, it was invented by leftists, and it was designed to appropriate the moral authority of the civil rights movement uh, to, this, to, to feminism. That's basically what it is. So you, you would take all the moral authority of the anti-racist struggles and turn it into an authority uh, for women who were rebelling against, well, we'll see. Before the term sexism, which I hated from the outset. I even hated it when I was a leftist because I knew what it was designed to do. Um, well, before sexism, first of all, I mean, you're all young people, so you know 
that the relations between the sexes are often problematic. Uh, it's, it's often uncharted territory. There are mixed signals, fumblings, misinterpreted uh, cues. So we used to have a lot of terms to, to get the individual truth of the situation. Some behavior is inappropriate, some behavior is rude, some behavior is boorish, some behavior is offensive, and some behavior, like rape, is criminal. But now we only have one word, really, sexism. And what does this lead to? Well, let's take somebody that I, I have very little regard for, uh, except I sympathize with him in this situation, which is Al Franken. This guy was a comedian. He did jokes. He filmed, took pictures of the jokes in which he groped women. There were like 10 of them or something. One woman, he groped when she was asleep. And she got upset. OK, that was inappropriate. It was boorish. It was offensive. Something to apologize for. This guy lost a Senate seat. I'm happy he did. But, I, but I'm going to def I will defend him. I mean, I'm happy just because of one less Democrat in the Senate is a good thing, always. Um, but the fact of the matter is this, <laughs> this, this is like lynching. A key, and, and he never really got to defend himself. He was just accused. And it's this broad term, sexism. Another individual whom I don't have a high regard for, although some of his stories are interesting, is uh, Garrison Keillor of, of public television. This guy was an icon. He had this television program for 30 years. He was uh, a star in their firmament. Now they've erased him. They took away his program. And why? Because he inappropriately touched a woman's back. I am so glad I am not your age and in college. As a male, I mean, it's a minefield. And it's guilty before the fact, just the way white people are guilty before the fact. I mean, let's take this incident in, uh, in Philadelphia, since we're in Pennsylvania. Isn't that where the Starbucks was? OK. Two black males, young black males, much bigger than I am come into Starbucks, and they want to use the restroom. And a, a, a much littler female says that's a company policy is you have to buy something. And I don't know what words were exchanged, but they said something like, F off. We're not listening to you. And this woman, whether we, again, this is like all human interactions, it's filled with uncertainties. She got scared and she called 911. And these cops came, and of course the police chief in Philadelphia is black. The cops came, I don't even know what race the cops were, but they, they cuffed these guys, which they shouldn't have done. I mean, you see the situation, you say, hey gentlemen, there's a policy here, leave. But suddenly, the head of Starbucks is pulling 8,000 workers off work so they can get uh, sensitivity training in their in unconscious bias. Think of what that means, unconscious bias. <laughs> and this poor woman is now, she's yanked off her job, and she's got a reputation as a racist. Well, thank goodness she's also a fighter, and she's suing Starbucks, and I hope she takes the president of Starbucks down for what he did. But that's, that's the situation. It can only get worse if we lose sight of the fundamental American principle, which is we judge people as individuals. We look at a situation and we try to understand what actually happened before jumping to the conclusion that because there's a white person there, she must be a racist. Uh, in, in, in my title of this talk, I said this was totalitarian. 
And this is exactly what totalitarian is. It's what Marx did and what Marxists do. Only for Marx, it was about class oppression. So you don't see the individual. You see only what class they're from. If they're workers, they're saints. <laughs> if they're employers, they're bad. In, in Russia, when the, when the Marxists took power, there's a, um, was a statement by an official of the secret police there, which perfectly reflects the mentality. And what he said was, we are not, and, and they killed millions of people, we're not uh, about individuals. We want to eliminate the bourgeoisie as a class. And they set out to, well, they, they murdered eight million um, peasants who owned land. If a peasant owned the land, then he's in the kulak class. You know, we don't care what the evidence is. We don't care what this person did, whether they're a good person or a bad person, or a generous person or a selfish person. They're a kulak. So we're going to put them in the gulag or shoot them. That's the end game. Now, we're a long way from that, thank goodness. But if you look at the Me Too movement, we'll see we're not really that, that far away. Again, accusations, no trial, no assertion of facts. And we know what happened. I mean, the casting couch is really old. It, it's deal making. I will make you a star. And I can't believe what these guys ask these women to do, but you know, if you come, well, first of all, let's have a meeting in my hotel room. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I appear naked or whatever. I mean, this is disgusting behavior on the part of these people. Some of them uh, are, you know, I'm, I don't know if they're gonna prosecute Harvey Weinstein for rape. If he raped people, I hope they do. But the people who are at the outcry and are patting themselves on the back as the Me Too movement, these are mainly people who made the deal. They got to be stars because they slept with the directors. So we have to get rid of this morality play that we're ensnared in and return to these very basic values. Yeah, of course, some guilty people are going to get off if we go through the trial. What is a lynching about? Lynching is we're going to avoid the legal process. We're just going to, somebody's accused of a heinous crime, we're just going to take them out and string them up. And of course, lynching is now being used, again, to skewer white people. A third of lynch victims were white because it was frontier justice. Of course, there was racism involved in stringing up some blacks, but not all. I mean, I've written a, I wrote an article, you can find it on the web, it's called Anatomy of a Lynching. And it's the most famous lynching of all. Um, it's the picture that you've all seen, two, two black males strung up. It's a horrifying picture strung up from a tree. There were actually three black males involved. And they were all yanked out of jail because a young white worker was murdered and it was alleged that his girlfriend was raped. The, and I learned this by, I was listening to NPR, who interviewed the third black involved. And this guy was not lynched because he said he was innocent, that he, had, he was in the car, but he had not participated in the crime. And a white woman in the lynch mob vouched for him and said, yeah, he, he's innocent. And so he was spared. And I heard him interviewed on NPR not, not that long ago. And uh, he served time because he was, it, they robbed this guy. And they did murder him. But so he was, it, because he was in the car, he had to serve some time in jail. He went on to found 
three chapters of the NAACP in Indiana, and he, and, he, and he became a civil rights worker. So when he tells you that these other guys actually murdered that guy, it's true. Should they have been strung up? No. But this isn't a case of, of white people uh, grabbing blacks on the street and stringing them up because of the color of their skin. It just isn't. And yet Google is funding the, it's called the Equal Justice Initiative, and Brian Stevenson, and it's only about black lynching. So it creates the impression that only blacks were lynched. Um, and the head of this initiative, Brian Stevenson, his slogan is, slavery never ended, it only evolved. This is a libel. And I'll tell you who gets hurt the most in these libels. I mean, there may come a day when they start stringing up white people because the left is so filled with hate and so willing to smear people. Um, but what kind of message does it send if you call America white supremacist and you attribute uh, white people's success to racism and you see it's all rigged? What does this do to the incentive of young black people in America to better themselves and achieve? We actually live in a country where Snoop Doggy Dog, who is a gang member in, Con in Compton and probably has, God knows, killed people, is he's worth, what, $200 million? This is America. This is an amazing place for people. And, and, and we need to, in this civil war, we need to defend it. And I am sorry to say that the Democratic Party is overwhelmed with these politics. It, it, it's just terrible what's happened to the Democratic Party. Um, Trump has done more in a year and a half for black Americans than Obama did in eight years in the presidency. That's the irony of it. Thank you.